So I am still Peter Stein, uh, and I am one of the managing directors of the Lime Timber Company, uh, co-founder of the Conservation Finance Network, and now with about 35 new friends in the audience. Um, this session is really to sort of uh, provide two perspectives, slightly overlapping, but two different perspectives uh, in the sort of private investment, impact investment, mission-related investment space. There are a lot of terms that have been used over the years, uh, double bottom line, triple bottom line, ESG investing, obviously a term you don't use in Texas or Florida anymore. Uh, but uh, we uh, are going to try to cover that world uh, in the next hour and 15 minutes. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, and my co-presenter is Jason Scott. Jason and I have known each other for a long time, uh, originally through a firm he founded called Eco Assets Advisors, then, encouraged, then it was renamed Encourage Capital. He was also the co-founder of the Creo Syndicate, which is a thought leadership group for impact investing, which uh, every now and then invites me to some of their meetings. Um, and um, much more recently, he joined the Resource Renewal Group, and even more recent, recently is part of uh, uh, Spring Lane Capital, which he will describe. So I have um, this relatively deep but narrow set of experience around sustainable land uh, investing, uh, forests, farms, limited development, wetland mitigation banks, things like that. And uh, uh, Jason's experience is much broader, renewables, water deals, all kinds of... Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I was about to go in, into that as well. Um, so uh, let me get started. So uh, a few of you have heard about my heard a little bit about my personal professional history. I was lucky enough to be one of the founding staff of the Trust for Public Land. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you get to keep these presentations. If you want to ask, why in the world did you help buy the Martin Luther King National Historic Site in 1979, just as James Watt was becoming Secretary of the Interior? And I still have the letter that says, over my dead body, will that ever become a national park? Obviously, he was wrong. It is a national park. Uh, but I had like all kinds of interesting experiences. And in the late 80s, uh, I met a group called the Lime Timber Company. They owned three of the Gap properties in the southwest portion of Virginia, uh, within the boundaries of the Jefferson National Forest, that were missing pieces for the Appalachian Trail, meaning that unless you used a giant pogo stick, you were going to have to figure out a way to to bypass these privately owned properties that the National Park Service and U.S. Forest Service wanted with the, with, I don't even know what the name of, Trust for Appalachian Trail Lands or Appalachian, it's now called Appalachian Trail Conservancy, that this was the path that Benton Mackay had laid out in the 1920s for the Appalachian Trail. Uh, so I was working with the Trust for Public Land um, optioned those properties from the Lime Timber Company. I had never heard of a timber investment firm. I didn't, it, 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 well, it really actually probably wasn't even an asset class right then, but I had no idea what, why people would invest in timberland. And that's how I met Lime Timber. A uh, number of years later, uh, American Can Company was merging into Travelers Insurance. All of the divestitures from the paper companies were beginning to happen. And the U.S. Forest Service called and there was a 10,000 acre inholding. Again, I'm still working at the Trust for Public Land. 10,000 acre inholding in uh, the Nicolay National Forest in Wisconsin, uh, known as the Cathedral of the Pines. I mean, just remarkable property. Uh, we go to New York City, if any of you remember a very significant member of the business community globally, Sandy Wheel, he was, uh, putting these businesses together. Um, and we go to a meeting, we explain what a bargain sale is, um, which is if you sell for less than appraised value, the difference is a charitable contribution. They like got that really quickly. They said, could we caucus? I didn't know what they really meant, uh, but it meant we had to leave the room for a while. And uh, we're brought back in about 15 minutes later and um, 
the response is really cool idea about the bargain sale, but would you buy our Midwest Forest Products subsidiary, which had an extra 80,000 acres and two manufacturing mills? And I said, hmm, not going to be a fun meeting when I go to the board of the directors of the Trust for Public Land to say, well, the good news is I got this gigantic discount. The bad news or the, the complication is there's an extra 80,000 acres involved and two mills. Uh, so I wasn't willing to do that, but I was willing to pursue the transaction with a great team of people that worked at the Trust for Public Land. And uh, what we did was option the property, gain control over everything, uh, and pre-sell all the things except the 10,000 acres that the US Forest Service wanted. And uh, uh, what happened to the 80,000 acres? It was sold to the Lime Timber Company because uh, I couldn't find anybody else who could make a decision in the 30 day window I had to find uh, a buyer of that property. The problem was there probably were conservation attributes on those 80,000 acres, but we ha didn't have time in 30 days. We did talk to the Wisconsin chapter of the Nature and Conservancy. We talked to two tribes. We talked to some local government units in Wisconsin DNR. So part of that deal was a repurchase agreement for up to 20,000 acres of the 80,000 acres. So for the next four years, Trust for Public Land retained the right to reacquire, Trust for Public Land only owned that land for a nanosecond in these multiple closings that took place. So after it was transferred to Lime Timber, Trust for Public Land retained the right to acquire more land and about 10,000 acres of additional land was conserved out of that transaction. That showed me how private equity might be helpful, private capital might be helpful to land conservation, particularly if you wanted to work at a larger scale. The fact that they could make a decision in 30 days was pretty impressive. The fact that they were willing to negotiate this repurchase agreement that gave literally the ability to take to use science to figure out what were some of the other conservation priorities and talk to lots of different partners uh, over those four years. Uh, so when my wife and I and two very small children were moving from New York City to San Francisco to stay with the Trust for Public Land, uh, the founder of TPL showed up in the office and said, that's crazy, was brilliant but very direct person. Uh, why don't you become a capitalist? And um, fortunately, I married a really smart woman because I struggled with this. But my wife, who was also working for the Trust for Public Land and kept working for the Trust for Public Land, Land said, that's a good idea. Uh, so uh, I won't go into any more of that, but I wanted to use that to frame how in the world I moved from the NGO world to the for profit world 30 years ago. So this is sort of what Jason and I are going to touch on in the next half hour for 25 minutes. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions and challenges from the audience. Uh, I think uh, uh, Reggie shared a slide sort of like this, uh, just to kind of set the stage, pure fiduciary, what traditional investing, what other folks might call pure fiduciary investors, uh, uh, these are folks who uh, either don't care or have trouble with things like double bottom line, triple bottom line, uh, mission related versus financially related outcomes or, or uh, returns. That's in the top left corner. So they're looking for market rate return and they don't want to make it super complicated. Um, so they might still be investing in nuclear power plants or guns and ammo or oil or what have you. And they probably make great other investments, but they're really not looking at either the manager with respect to their values or the non-financial result outcomes of those investments. They're just looking for the financial results. As we go um, to the right on this chart, you'll see socially responsible, the reason I use the term socially responsible investing, you might think of that as screening, meaning I'm not going to invest in nuclear power. I'm not going to uh, be part of the uh, vice 
DC funds. Uh, I'm not going to do bad things. I'm just going to be neutral. Uh, or I'll, I'll maybe look for some modestly good things, but I'm not really going to dig into the non-financial outcomes associated with those investments. And I would put that uh, when, when those things begin to happen, I would put that into the impact investing box. We've heard the term mission-related investing. Uh, there was an advisory firm. Uh, they don't use this term anymore because people ask questions. It was called full consequence investing. Like, why aren't we you thinking about that all the time? Like, you know, uh, 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 anyway, um, and we certainly have talked about program-related re investments, but there's been a little, I'm going to stop there for a second. We're not going to talk much about program-related investments. You've heard the term PRIs, uh, but let's just be really clear. That's a technical term within the Internal Revenue Code, and if you want to talk about that a little more during the break, uh, but it's been used a little loosely in the last two or three days, and I, I just want to make sure that that people understand it's a, it's a very specific technical term. So um, the investors are families and individuals and places. Uh, one of Lyme's investors is the Yale University endowment. So college endowments, foundation endowments, uh, pension funds. Uh, sometimes there are structures known as fund funds. So an invest, investment advisor recruits managers in different asset classes. So we are one of the underlying managers of three different funds of funds because we were picked as the timber investment manager and they picked someone else for renewables and someone else for real estate and someone else for um, agricultural land. Uh, the investees are the people who actually manage the money. Uh, so the investors are the people who have the money and give it to the investees. So just, just to get some of the terms correct. Here are some examples. You can look at this when you're spending time this weekend recuperating from this week. Uh, this is because there are things happening all the time. This is a pretty up-to-date slide of what I would call uh, the double bottom line, triple bottom line, impact-oriented investment managers in these three spaces. So forest land, ecosystem services, agriculture, and ranch land. Again, I'm not gonna go through this, but just gives you a reference point. Uh, it's not just to be really clear, it's not just lime timber. If I showed this slide 26 years ago, it would just be lime timber, but it's a much larger field uh, of activity today. Um, what I thought I would do is unpack a specific transaction for you, and I'm going to try to do it very quickly. Uh, the great publication uh, about community forests that I think we referenced in your materials. Uh, community forests uh, in the United States uh, started with King George about 300 years ago. Uh, think of it as the town commons. Uh, it's an idea that uh, then kind of was forgotten about for a long time. Uh, there are county forests in the Midwest, town forests in New England. Um, this is public land, these are public land units. Uh, but in uh, as the paper companies began there, the publicly traded paper companies began the divestiture of timberland, the community forest movement took off in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and Peter's a former group, well, it's still in existence, but Peter used to work there. The Open Space Institute has done a lot of regranting and lending for community forests, the Trust for Public Land, Vermont Land Trust, uh, Society for Protection of New Hampshire Forests, Pacific Forest Trust out west, Sustainable Northwest out west. There are a variety of land trusts or land conservation NGOs that have been involved in community forests. This one, let me go to the map. So the, the strangest green color in the very middle of this map is a 22,000 acre property that was owned by the same family for 160 years. And it never wanted to sell or conserve for that matter. In the course of the last 25 years, look at the amount of conservation that took place around the hole in the donut. A million acres of conserved land uh, crossing the border 
into Eastern Canada. Um, as happens with families, uh, about 2008, 2009, there was a disagreement in the family about the future of this property, and they wanted to sell it very quickly. If any of you remember what was happening in the fall of 2008, uh, this may have been the only real estate transaction on earth that closed in the fall of 2008 because it was the, the global financial crisis. Uh, we put the deal together at the request of a land trust partner. So we were invited into this transaction by Down East Lakes Land Trust. Uh, quite candidly, we were a little surprised. They had a staff of two and a half full-time people. Most of our conservation transactions had been done with groups, much larger groups, <laughs> but they had the credibility to be our partner. They knew the landscape, they knew the town, they actually had very good uh, philanthropic relationships, they had very good public agency relationships, uh, and they recruited us. Uh, but we're not totally brave. We were exceedingly uh, worried at that moment in time. Uh, so we asked the land trust to do something that they had never done before. And they thought we were crazy, but they did it, uh, which was to make a million dollar at risk option payment. Uh, which meant that they had to find, they didn't have a million dollars. <laughs> they had about 60 days. Uh, we, we gave them some hints as to where they might find the million dollars, uh, but they had about 60 days to come up with a million dollars. Uh, and that was the condition for us. So we had an agreement to buy the land. Um, that agreement was subject to a financing contingency, a very broad financing contingency. And there were two things we were doing for the financing contingency. One was to get an option payment from the land trust. And the second was to get comfortable that we would be able to secure new markets tax credit financing for this transaction. Um, it would upset your breakfast if I go into a lot of details about new markets tax credit financing, but it's a federal income tax credit, not a deduction. Uh, we have things like endowments. So like why in the world is lime timber thinking about new markets tax credits, our underlying investors can't use tax credits. Well, we partner with a bank who has a positive federal tax liability. They get the tax credit, we get to borrow money at a very low rate. Uh, it's a slightly more complicated than that, but we can talk about that at lunchtime. Uh, so uh, what I did in the green, uh, in the green words on the right side of the, of of the presentation is, uh, sorry about the food met metaphor, but this is sort of the lasagna or the layer cake of how partners brought either expertise or funding to the transaction. So uh, I just told you what the Down East Lakes Land Trust did. They did uh, actually three things. They, they built our confidence that they'd be a good partner and help us with the politics uh, and community relations associated with this transaction. Second thing is the million dollar uh, tax credit. And then the third thing, and perhaps the fourth thing is they had one of the earliest California Air Resources Board uh, pre-compliant carbon projects on other land that they owned. And we knew quite a bit about that. And we told them two things. One is we hope that some of your carbon credit proceeds would be used for the match for the Forest Legacy Program, which they did. Uh, and secondly, that we would then do a carbon project together on this 22,000 acres, and we'd split, share the proceeds of those credits. Uh, the reason being that their share of the receipt of those proceeds essentially lowered the purchase price of the conservation easement encumbered property when they wanted to acquire those rights to expand their community forest. So it wasn't just an easement transaction, it was an easement transaction sort of as phase one, and phase two was the purchase of the conservation easement encumbered property by this land trust to expand their community forest. In the last two or three years, Trust for Public Land helped them expand that community forest even more. I think it's close to 60,000 acres. It may be the largest community forest in the country right now. Uh, so Finite Carbon was the carbon project developer that both the land trust had worked with, Lime had worked with in other ge geographies, and it was the group, the carbon project developer that we worked with 
on this. State of Maine Land for Future, Futures Board. Uh, this is the state funding mechanism that the voters approved and the previous governor wouldn't sell the bonds, but there was a lawsuit. Um, and anyway, the bonds got sold and that was also part of the match for the Forest Legacy Program. Uh, the Forest Service provided a Forest Legacy Grant. This was uh, the Lime Timber Company has done 16 Forest Legacy projects around the country. Uh, this was the uh, second time we were in the top five in a project in Michigan. It's now the third time we're in the top five in the country. The Sweetwater Trust is a philanthropy based in Massachusetts. Uh, they believe in Forever Wild. They don't really like the Lime, well, they, they kind of like the Lime Timber Company, but uh, there was a 3,000 acre forested wetland complex in a corner of this property that met their requirements for no touch, forever wild. So the conservation easement uh, doesn't, uh, that was paid for by the Forest Legacy Program doesn't touch those 3,000 acres. A separate forever wild conservation easement can serve that portion of the property. The open space. Institute put money that they had raised uh, from a variety of, of foundations into this project. Uh, the Northern Forest Center uh, was willing to do something that no one at Lime Timber was willing to do, which was to go to monthly meetings of the tiny little select board uh, in this cute little town, tiny little town, to explain what in the world New Market's tax credit financing was. Uh, and that was like really, really important. <laughs> Uh, just to hold the hand of the community about this very complicated financing that was being used. They also helped uh, us help the project keep about 200 acres out of the conservation easement. Because remember that family owned this property and there's a town adjacent to the property that could never grow, never expand because the family would never allow any of their land to be developed. So we kept 200 acres out of the conservation easement just for future growth of the town. Uh, and the town voted at town meeting to put 40 or $50,000. I mean, this is a town of like 180 people uh, to put 40 or $50,000 into the transaction. Uh, and Coastal Enterprises, which is a community development finance institution. Uh, again, we can't get go into much of the details, but they, were, they received what is called an allocation of new markets tax credits. So in order to use new markets tax credit financing, you have to work with a community development organization that has received an allocation of these tax credits from the US Treasury Department. We had done this three other times with Coastal Enterprises. So uh, while there's brain damage doing this, there was a lot less brain damage by using the same partners multiple times. So um, I am running out of time, <laughs> uh, but just so you understand, the purchase was in remember the fall of 2008, uh, conservation easement sale occurs, the carbon credit sales help write down or support the purchase of the encumbered land. And about eight years later, uh, this land is acquired by Down East Lakes Land Trust, subject to all these easements, subject to a carbon agreement, and they're still getting revenue from the carbon agreement. They're actively managing the property. And um, there's about another 3,500 acres of community forest that was added uh, in the last couple of years through a partnership with the Trust for Public Land. So um, we're gonna have at least 30 minutes in this session for Q&A. So try to remember. 20 minutes, <laughs> uh, and I'm going to stop there, but say hello to the moose. Jason. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I do have, because I'll, I can do the, you can do the moose. certainly, certainly interesting versions of many things that Peter covered. Oh, I can cover a lot in 15 minutes. I don't know that much, but it's easy. Um, so first of all, my name is Jason Scott. Um, I currently work, work with a firm called Spring Lane Capital that I will tell you guys about at the end. Is my principal motivation for coming here is that we actually have money to invest in projects and would like to do a transaction in the natural capital nature-based solutions world, of which Peter is the, um, I'm trying to think of a word that is non-ageist, senior leader <laughs> of the tribe. 
<laughs> I start getting those comments too now, so I'm very sensitive. Um, but uh, I, I will do just just a quick couple minutes of background, just so um, you guys have some context. And and I should say that I probably worked with two thirds of the organizations in this room at one point. Although it turns out none of the people here, I don't think, but. Between Culp and Kelly and Blue Forest and all the NGOs and a bunch of other awesome groups here, I was really happy to see um, that uh, everyone's supporting this boot camp, but also going to take all this back to your to your groups. Um, it has been a it's been a long and winding road for me to end up here, so um, I thought it'd be helpful just to explain a couple things. So I, I started off my career in nonprofits and politics, a lot like Peter, and I think like a lot of other people in the in this space and um ended up being a software entrepreneur in new york city in the 90s and moved to london to help start a firm called generation investment management where i actually covered software it was a public equity firm i guess somewhere in that slide in the upper right mission high on returns low on impact i would say but still somewhere on the chart um but um al gore was the chairman of the firm and as the only american in london who cared about politics, I ended up following around Europe for a couple of years and learning about climate change. And uh, like many people, I changed my life and my career trajectory. And so I left Generation to start um, this firm. Peter mentioned Echo, which became Encourage Capital. And we invested in carbon, water, biodiversity, mitigation banking, things like that. We actually had a carbon fund for the California market. It's involuntary carbon deals, started a RED project, which is now called Emergent Climate or the Leaf Coalition. Um, and along the way, we did a bunch of transactions with a firm called Renewable Resource Group in California. And so I ended up joining RRG um, a couple of years ago, which is what I'll talk about for the most part. Um, I'm gonna talk about a transaction we did, um, but the firm I work at now called Spring Lane Capital um, is a sustainable infrastructure fund. Just to give you a sense of what that means, it means that we're investing in things like renewable natural gas, EVs, um, more um, any somewhere where we have to build something, something complex, something difficult, um, something that takes permitting, something that takes offtake, something that has a, a management team but more important needs project development. We consider ourselves kind of good at supporting project developers and building projects. Um, we just finished raising a new fund and we'd really like to find a way to do something in this whole world. And what that means is are we supporting a mitigation banking development developer or are we building a mill connected to a forest or something like that. We've looked at voluntary carbon deals, we've looked at compliance carbon deals. Um, but that's what my principal interest is in kind of re-engaging in, in, in this world. Um, and then along the way, as Peter mentioned, I, I helped start a network of family offices called CREO, which um, originally stood for clean tech, renewables and environmental opportunities but nobody really made no sense to anyone. So we just called it Creo. But the interesting and important thing about Creo, it's a nonprofit, but we're basically a deal platform for family offices. And so to the extent you guys have transactions, you have deals, you have funds you're raising, we put both deals and funds on that platform. We have a whole research team that covers it. We have an amazing woman named Gabrielle Leslie who covers all the ag and real asset stuff that I'm happy to put anyone in touch with. If you are raising money for anything, she is happy to talk to you. Um, so I'll talk about ROG briefly. Um, so I met the team from ROG in 2008, 2009. Um, they were what you call in our world a fundless sponsor, which means they had no money and lots of deals. Uh, so they'd run around and they go tie up land or a project and they'd go begging for cash and hope it worked. Um, so I met them when they were out begging for cash, connected them to a family office um, called Capricorn which is Jeff Scholes, one of the founders of eBay's family office. And they took a pretty bet on pretty big bet on three or four of their projects. And the fundamental thesis behind ROG is that uh, in California, where they were based, you basically have a spine of um, water resources, which is the, the, the system that moves water around the state. It happens to be the same system they use to move electricity around the state. It happens to surround the Central Valley and have the coast on um, the left and nothing on the right. Um, so their idea was you could buy land um, where they were currently growing something. You could bring water to that land and grow something else. But you could also build 
um, renewables on that land. So the original ROG story was go buy a piece of land that doesn't have any water or has low water, bring high water to it, do renewables on it, and you have this kind of multiple optionality on the exit. Um, it's evolved a lot since then, but the fundamental thesis is still the same, which is that, um, as a lot of people know, if you were in this world and you read the newspaper at all, <laughs> there actually is enough water in California. It's just being moronically used. Um, so, you know, we know the wall of the river, there's Jennifer from Culp of Kelly here. I don't want to get in trouble. Hey, hi, Jennifer. Peter was a lawyer who advised ROG and other people. So I'm going to say a bunch of stuff that you can not correct me on in public. Um, but, but in general, what it means is, you know, if, if you have the first right, you can use it for whatever you want. And it kind of goes down the chain. So a lot of water in California is used um, for uh, high water use, low value crops. So the Imperial Valley is the biggest culprit. They grow alfalfa. They don't. I mean, they flood irrigate, they do all kinds of stupid stuff. They use most of the water in California to grow alfalfa to feed cows. It gets shipped to China and then sent back here to eat. It is literally the dumbest thing we could ever do with a valuable resource. And there's nothing we can do to stop it right now. Um, the Hunt brothers famously tried to buy up Imperial Valley and reached, they, got, they got killed. We own a piece of land in Imperial Valley. We thought we could kind of, it's an elected board that decides where the water goes. We thought we could take it over. We're getting killed. Nobody can do anything about it. So what can you do about it? What you can do about it is you can buy land in strategic places, we think, and try to, it's very hard to do low value, low water use things, but we do high value, high water use things. So we grow things like permanent crops, like almonds, pistachios, grapes, dates, oranges, things like that, that admittedly use a lot of water, but we try to grow them in places where there is a lot of water. <laughs> so those are places where there isn't. And then the second thing that I think ROG does really well is partner with local government, create joint ventures with water authorities, things like that. What we don't do is buy land, dry it out and sell the water to the cities, which makes you very unpopular with local people who it turns out like to farm and they buy seeds and tractors. And that's another way to get killed in California. Um, so the idea with ROG was to buy land in places where you could bring water to it, grow high value crops, um, and partner with local water authorities to make sure you're sharing the water. The thing we pioneered in um, California was we also had a geologist on our team named Dave Dorrance, who's kind of a weird genius, and by the way, has identified one little piece of land in Vermont, which he thinks is the only place that will not be affected by the coming apocalypse and bought up most of that valley. I can tell you where it is. Um, it's not a secret. Um, but uh, Dave, what Dave figured out is ge you could geologically store water through water cycles. So we didn't just buy land near uh, transmission and uh, near the canal system. We also bought land where you could geologically store it and save it from cycle to cycle. But the key is not to trade it for its highest value. The key is to, to share it and move it around the state virtually um, and, and actually through the irrigation and through the canal system, but also virtually um, trade with districts from one side of the valley to the other. So the first deal that we did, um, which is where I'll end, um, is a deal called Cap and Arrow. The first deal we did in a fund called the Sustainable Water Impact Fund, uh, which I'll tell you about the genesis of in a minute. It's a deal called Cap and Arrow Creek where we bought a dairy. The dairy was being decommissioned because it didn't have enough water. <laughs> um, so the deal that we cut was we bought the dairy. Um, it was a multiple generation dairy. Uh, there was a daughter who wanted to keep part of the dairy. So we let her keep part of the dairy. Um, we took the alfalfa they were using to feed the cows out. Um, we put in pistachios. We created a conservation easement with TNC. Um, we got money from the state for the conservation easement. Um, and now net net, we're using less water. We're creating more value from the crops. We still have a dairy and we have a bird flyover area for that the, the state of California is paying for. So that's the kind of transaction that ROG is ideally looking for. But what is not ironic is that it involves almost all the same things Peter just talked about. Right? Multi-generational family, with some unusual dynamic, right? 
doing something, I would argue, generically not uh, stupid, but something that is conventional that doesn't make sense in the current environment that we have for natural resources. Uh, partnering with local government, so the local water authority, which had to give us permission to do all this water banking and take the dairy out of production and change crops. I'm going to beat the five minute thing. I'm very excited. Um, and then, and then, um, uh, and then <laughs> and then partner with a nonprofit who interfaces with the state, does the science, helps convince everyone that you can do what you said you were going to do. So um, I don't think it's proprietary, but no. Could you just describe? Excuse me. Yeah. Oh. Give him a mic. Peter doesn't. Peter doesn't need a mic. <laughs> So, Jason, could you yeah. describe the role that um, the capital and the science of the Nature Conservancy play yeah. in the sustainable? Yeah, good. Yeah, so um, so I'll take one step back, which is um, so what ROG did over a number of years, and a lot of you all will be familiar with this, is they were a fundless sponsor, as I mentioned. So they'd go find a deal, they'd go get the money, they tie up the land, they put their own money at risk. Um, they did a lot of development, so they'd have to tie up the land, go try to get a permit for the solar, go try to get a permit to change the way the land was used, go try to get a permit for the water bank. They'd have to build something, they'd have to drill, they'd have to do all the geology, whatever they'd have to do. And then eventually they have to put up a very large sum of money, you know, tens of millions in one case. We did a deal that was um, with um, the Harvard Endowment and UC Regents, or and Capricorn, I think, which was like, $250 million and it was solar and it was water storage. So anyway, after we'd done about 10 or 12 of those transactions and probably put a billion and a half dollars to work in very idiosyncratic structures and deals with different partners, we decided to go raise a fund. Actually halfway through that, we tried to go raise a fund um, based on a project we did in the Delta with Zurich Insurance. Um, we couldn't raise the fund, we didn't have enough track record. So like three or four years later, we went back to market. So we want to raise a fund. Um, at the time, I don't think anyone had done this before. Um, we decided the only way we could raise a fund around water in California, which is kind of controversial and a lot of people had lost a lot of money, including Tom Steyer and Farallon and the Hunt brothers and whatever was to go find a nonprofit partner. And over kind of the two decades of ROG, they partnered with the alphabet soup of NGOs, um, on small deals. Um, but we went to uh, TNC, we knew the senior leadership there pretty well, and said, hey, we'd like you to be a, an equity partner in this, um, in this fund. So basically, we want you to own, and this is public information, we'll give you 20% of what we make. So in a fund, the manager gets 20, the capital gets 80, we, get, we offer them 20% of our 20 which is not insignificant. We ended up raising almost a billion dollars. It's a significant amount of potential um, carry or profit. Uh, the way that profit and carry is allocated is that we set we have a, um, a three-person technical advisory council, a graduate of this fine institution, Alyssa Go is RG's head of sustainability um, from TNC, whoever happens to be the head of nature vest at the time, or I think. I can't even keep track of who it is now. <laughs> There's someone else on the T on the TAC now. Um, and um, and then a professor from Stanford who's a famous water professor, kind of as a third um, third person. So every deal has to go through the technical advisory committee. It has to get approved by the technical advisory committee. And that advisory committee sets uh, conservation outcomes for the deal. ROG can earn back its 20% if it hits the conservation outcomes for the deal. So we could end up with 100% of the carry or we can end up with 80. If we don't hit the conservation outcomes for the deal, TNC gets the money, which could end up being hundreds of millions of dollars in theory. And they have to spend it on conservation in the area in which the deals didn't meet their goals. So that's the structure. It's incredibly, um, complex, obviously, in execution, but fundamentally what TNC is doing is they're helping us source deals, diligence deals, manage assets. We've had one or two interesting kind of uh, challenges, which you could
could have guessed and we could have guessed, but actually to see them play out, like we've worked through them all, it has been really interesting because if it, like ultimately there are trade-offs. Like there's literally no way there is not a conservation and um, financial outcome trade-off. It's literally impossible in a billion dollar fund not to face that. We faced a couple, we've gotten through it. TNC cannot veto a deal on environmental grounds. They can veto a deal on conservation grounds which on one they did, and they opted out of approving it. We decided to do it anyway. If we do that again, the fund's over. We get one, one pass. <laughs> and it wasn't like we were doing something crazy, but we were, they were doing something they would have rather us not done. If we were doing something crazy, they would have lost. So that's the structure. It's a pretty, and we're doing the same thing with WWF now with a different structure based on the lessons learned from the water fund called the Sustainable Water Impact Fund. I think we put the impact report up, yeah. um, which is kind of cool. And we have, we have Jason, not just now, but through the rest of the morning, through one time, I think. So through the uh, first break. We can, <laughs> we can ask him more questions. Uh, but yeah. I, I think we can open it up for Q&A. Yeah, questions. no, that's it. I'm good. good. Okay. Maybe there are no questions about this. That would surprise me, but sure. Since we're live streaming this, we're going to bring mics around. Good morning. I'm Carrie Kasnicka from the Trust for Public Land. Thank you both for everything you've done. Um, for Jason, I'm in Texas where water policy is fairly controversial and ever changing. Well, right, right, exactly. So <laughs> you, you, you know my pain, if not more. So um, is it important to? to pounce when the policy is, for an investor perspective, to pounce when it looks like the policy is going to not be as controversial or do you sort of wait and let it let the dust settle and kind of see where where you end up a couple years from now? Like it, where is sort of that balance of being able to be opportunistic, but also for an investor perspective to know that years from now, there's not going to be something that will, will bunk up a deal? Um, well, I'll, I'll give two different answers. So. I think that um, the group, the team at RRG is very, 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 very involved in water policy, but not um, publicly. Because I do think that public engagement of, this is just specifically on investors, public engagement of investors around natural resources is a terrible, terrible idea. I think Peter, you'd agree. They're even trying to pass laws right now in California around hedge funds and water, which is like honestly moronic because it just shows they have no idea what they're trying to legislate against, right? But you know, in the US, it's now very hard for foreign entities, which include sovereign wealth funds who actually have a lot of money and want to do a lot of conservation to buy land in America, which is a really dumb thing for America, by the way. So um, investors are toxic. When it comes to water policy, there's a group called Water Asset Management that a lot of you guys might know who've gotten in a lot of trouble for doing press releases. RG has never done a press release in its entire career. It drives a lot of us crazy who have to go out and try to raise money, but that's why, because when Wham says that they bought this thing and they sold the water, guess what? <laughs> this is bad for Wham, bad for whatever local water board. So, um, now, behind the scenes, we have former EPA lawyers, we have folks on the ground in the Central Valley who are very close. You know, I think we were the only private equity firm, certainly, that's shown up at every water board meeting in every district in California for the last 25 years. And we have data from all of those meetings that we've tried. I mean, so like engagement is really important, but kind of public pronouncements are a terrible idea. Um, the last thing I'd say is that I will credit Peter Culp from Culp and Kelly for this is, you know, I, I think that Peter's philosophy, which he imbued on us, was that um, if investors can quietly show how you can make money in natural resources, specifically water, um, by doing the right thing, that creates policy, right? Instead of like, advocating for the policy that helps you do the thing, you do the thing, like the, the geological storage and water bank and partnership with the whatever irrigation district. And then you go to Sacramento and you say, 
hey, maybe you should make it easier for people to do this thing we did, go talk to the farmers in this water district. So I think, you know, he had that kind of inverse idea around water policy, which is show policymakers how markets can achieve a public outcome. Don't go tell them how to create policy to achieve an outcome that you want. Jason, if I can follow on that, yeah. um, Brad Gentry from Yale. Um, Peter, this starts with you, but it goes to the sort of future of carbon forest carbon credit markets, because one of your partners did a famous interview with the Wall Street Journal on how bad they were after you guys had made lots of money on it. How do you guys see I didn't, I didn't the see future that. of those? The future of those markets developing. So Peter, you first, and then Jason, you. So we've been pretty vocal about uh, what we call. Can you turn your mic on? We've been pretty vocal at Lime Timber about uh, how we'll just be played how porous um, the carbon markets are at the moment, particularly the voluntary market. So uh, Lime uh, did one of the pre-compliance. California Air Resources Board projects on land that we had acquired in Tennessee. Uh, during that time, they were trying to build the market. You could do carbon on land that was subject to a very restrictive conservation easement. I would argue, my colleague Jim Hortigan <laughs> argued, there was no additionality. Uh, everything was approved. We met all the requirements of the Air Resources Board. We verified it, monitored it, everything, but there was no additionality. They were just, a, you're not allowed to do this any longer. So of course the report reporters don't pick up on that, uh, but that was the evolution of, a, of the regulatory protocol in California that to get things started, uh, they had a lot of flexibility, but this was 2009 and 2010. Uh, look where that protocol has evolved since then. Voluntary protocol, voluntary market protocols are just beginning to evolve and get a lot more serious around baselines, which is what would happen to a forest if there wasn't a carbon project. Additionality, what I just referred to, if are you really changing behavior? Is there really gonna be more carbon stored? And secondly, the duration, uh, is it really, and uh, you know, we, we, many of us in the room know about NCX, is it, really good policy to allow carbon to be credited on an annual basis versus a much longer period of time. So the California protocol is 100 years. Uh, the improved forest management parts of ACR, American Carbon Registry, and VERA are 40 years. Uh, there's talk about something in between 40 and 100 years now in the voluntary market. So I do th see things improving, but we, um, Lindsay uh, can also opine on this. We have stayed out of those markets for the last three years, watching them, hopefully that they get more rigorous and as they evolve. I mean, I, I do think that just to start with like the end, end question, I, I do think reversal is a real possibility now. Like I think if you look at some of these voluntary carbon proxies that have been approved, but then the countries, the host countries, especially for voluntary carbon have halted them or say they're gonna take the credits back. Or um, I think that reversals in environmental markets is, is a real risk. Like, I don't think it's super clear that a lot of these credits that have been granted to people, it depends on what they're using them for. I mean, I think a California compliance market or a Reggie credit, like, I don't think those credits are going to be reversed. And like, what's the consequence of reversing a voluntary carbon credit? Like kind of nothing. So, but I, I think that investors are, when I, so when I started at Generation in 2004, we were amongst the first investors in Chicago Climate Exchange, Eco Securities, all the big carbon business in the US, in, the, in Europe, almost all of whom went out of business after making lots of money for lots of people, including lots of people we all know and love because they've all funded a lot of our stuff and teach in all these great schools. So <laughs> let's be clear, they're great people, but like they sold at the top and the markets blew up and that's like how markets work. 
that's how the crypto market works. That's how the software market works. That's how the chip market works. The problem is we're actually playing with the environment, which is as when you talk to asset allocators, they don't care, but we care, right? So it's a really tricky situation because like I would say for Encourage too, like we did two massive voluntary carbon deal. I mean, California compliance deals that worked out where we got the crediting numbers back from whoever it was. I'm like, this is bananas, you know? And it's like, what are you gonna do? Give the credits back? One we were doing with a Native American tribe and they were getting money to build, you know, tribal housing and things like that, right? I mean, we were getting a percentage of it, but they got most of the money. So it's a very tricky situation when you look at something and you're like, mm, I don't know. Like, and, and then you have a, a bigger commons problem, which is, I think what Jim was saying, although I feel like he was kind of boxed in a, the wrong corner of the article was like, this is a commons problem, right? Like if everybody does this, the market's going to go to hell. Guess what? The market's going to hell. Like the voluntary carbon market is in serious trouble right now. And it's because a lot of bad actors did bad things. And then a lot of good actors did marginal things, I would say. Um, even though I'd say a vast majority of the activities and the credits are real and additional and beneficial. The Wall Street Journal doesn't care about that. The Guardian doesn't care about that. Bloomberg doesn't care about it. They're just going to rip up the marginal stuff. So let me, before I go to the next questions, let me just ask a quick follow-up. Okay, just one quick thing. Sure. We just turned down a voluntary carbon deal because of all this noise. It's like RLPs aren't paying us to take stupid risk. We're like, well, I mean, we can't do this now if this market's so screwed up. So that leads into my question, which is um, assume that you guys are working with one of the NGOs who's thinking about partnering with you on a land deal. How should they sort of do due diligence on the markets and their reputational risk as they think about engaging with you all? Great question. I'm not sure we are the arbiter of that. Um, an example, many land trusts have explored carbon. It goes back to some of the early land trust carbon deals like Down East Lakes Land Trust or Mass Audubon um, or Audubon in South Carolina. These were all land trusts that were looking at carbon, doing carbon projects 10 years ago, 12 years ago now. Uh, their uh, Land Trust Alliance has spent a lot of time in the last two or three years sort of creating, I will call it guidance, suggestions. Um, you know, they're, one of the Bloomberg articles uh, picked on the nature preserve where my wife and I went bird watching the year before we got married. So it was 47 years ago. Uh, it's called Hawks Mountain. It's outside of Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm pretty sure there has never been a piece of logging equipment on that land. It's been a nature preserve for 60 years. It says, it says nature preserve. The donors are listed. They all gave money to a nature preserve. Uh, so what in the world was the additionality of TNC working with the nonprofit that owned the nature preserve during carbon deal? Now, Maybe I picked a bad example, but uh, that just, uh, it, it's been used actually by the Land Trust Alliance. If you look at the Wild Carbon Project, uh, which is a trademark name for the carbon credits that the Northeast Wilderness Trust, uh, where I think things are coming out is if the carbon proceeds are being used to acquire the land, either acquire the conservation easement on the land or acquire the land outright, fee simple, which eventually we'll describe, uh, uh, meaning owning all the rights associated with the land. Uh, that seems to be a safe pathway for pursuing a carbon project. If in the case of Mass Audubon, you take two, okay, I'll use a different word, not preserve, sanctuaries, again, pretty sure other than when a tree fell down that blocked a trail access or fell into the parking lot, was there ever any logging equipment on a Massachusetts Audubon sanctuary? Maybe for invasive, I don't know, but not, no commercial logging. Uh, so those kinds of transactions are viewed very negatively by not just 
investigative reporters, but by growing segments of the public, by regulators. So I think there's been a, a pretty strong move guidance from Land Trust Alliance and others uh, that if carbon is part of that layer cake, the lasagna that I referred to in the case of the Down East Lakes Land Trust, that, where the carbon proceeds are helping a land trust accomplish additional conservation, that seems to be a safe pathway. And Brad, I would just get something more broadly on partnering with investment firms like Trust But Verify it sounds silly, but Trust But Verify. I think it's very, I think it's much trickier than people realize. And it kind of, you know, I wouldn't say we started a trend, but we were certainly at the beginning of a trend with TNC and CI and now other people partnering um, with investment firms. I think that for us, like TNC and WWF, eyes wide open, commercial, commercial people on the board, investment committee understood what they were getting into. We'll see you know, how it all plays out. But in general, like it's been a very transparent and direct relationship and conversation, but there are trade-offs. Nothing is free. And I do think that the, you know, over a hundred percent of the deals, there'll be some percentage, maybe only a small number, 10 or 20% or 10 or 20% of the money or whatever, where you've got to make a hard choice and you have to be prepared to walk away from the deal and from the partnership and from the organization because ultimately as an NGO, it's not worth it. And you have to be able to extract yourself from the partnership because the problem with investment firms is um, no matter what their best intentions are, people leave, LPs change, like things change at investment firms just like they change at nonprofits. So, I mean, my advice would be obviously trust, but very high, but also um, if you just are like, well, they've got a great head of sustainability or I love the chairman or the person running this fund is amazing. They might not be there. Like you just need to be able to get out of it. And that kind of mutually, this isn't working is really important because this is going to be an increasing trend in our field. And we're going to see more and more partnerships blow up. None have blown up yet, but I'm sure they will. And not necessarily for bad reasons, right? Like you have a fiduciary obligation to maximize returns. And the one thing we got grilled about a lot by more sophisticated investors was, okay, what happens when? This is the fiduciary obligation to maximize returns. And this is what TNC wants. What is your conflict resolution? What are the outs for both sides? Hey, Jason, I, I work with Propagate. We're an agroforestry development platform. I, I, I know you, you know us in some way. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the role of the conservation easement in the Capanero Creek project. Um, just understanding, I think the you talk about like the trade-offs or the complexities or the reasons for it. You know, So like in, in part, it lowers the acquisition costs of the property, but are there other rationales for entering into these easements? Is it a core part of the investment strategy on every property that you're doing with a project like this to put an easement on that? Um, was it key to gaining you know, certain participation of other nonprofit partners in that project? It's, it's something that we've, we've been kicking around internally a lot in, in part why I'm here to sort of learn more about how we can partner with all the groups that can put those in place to help us advance our mission, which is to scale agroforestry in the US. I mean, I actually think the conservation is an effort, so I'm going to kick it to Peter, but I'll say one quick thing, which is we almost never underwrite a deal with a conservation easement in it because it's such an unpredictable um, outcome. And I think especially where we work, Peter, I think it's a lot harder to do it connected to ag land and in places like California than it is maybe in the Northeast and forestry. But so my answer is it, it, it has turned out to be really important but we would have done the deal without it because we underwrote the deal to not have it. Yeah, we uh, probably take a slightly maybe opposite approach, uh, <laughs> which is uh, if you look at our investments, uh, Lime Timber has acquired about 2.2, 2.3 million acres in its life and about 1.2, 1.3 million acres are subject to perpetual working forest conservation easements that, uh, and it's not by luck. We go to the geographies that 
uh, depending on the state, um, I'll pick on New Hampshire, the darkest color purple in the state wildlife action plan, it has the highest biodiversity habitat values. Why in the world did we invest in the headwaters forest for the Connecticut River? Because it was all dark purple under the state wildlife action plan. If you're competing, and this is a state that has trouble paying for kindergarten, sorry, I'm picking on New Hampshire again, uh, but uh, if you're competing for a relatively limited amount of public money to pay for a conservation easement, you're gonna focus on the highest conservation priorities in that jurisdiction. So if you looked at Lime Timber's current ownership and you ran it through the connected and resilient mapping tool of the Nature Conservancy, we own some of the most resilient attribute property in North America. Uh, it's not by accident. Uh, so we've filtered or we screen for those kinds of attributes, whether we do it or it's because Down East Lakes did it and brought us into a transaction or in the Adirondacks twice, once the conservation fund brought us into a transaction. Another time, uh, the New York chapter of the Nature Conservancy brought us into the transaction because it was pre-vetted as a conservation priority. Uh, doesn't mean it always works. Uh, I will share, I don't always share it because I'm a pretty optimistic person, but we had a conservation easement deal that didn't work. I mean, it's a little hard to believe that we've done about 125 of these and only one didn't work, but still one did not work. I used to say all of our deals worked, but a very important one didn't work in California. Uh, and it didn't have to do with a lack of public funding. It had to do with a lack of agreement from a partner we had in the deal. So we had optioned, uh, in this case, it was a private investment partner. So 25% of the land was owned by that partner. 75% of the land was owned by Lime. We had an option agreement that was amended 24 times with the California chapter of the Nature Conservancy to keep improving the easement and giving them more time. And the partner would not agree to the 25th amendment of that option agreement, which was a change in the terms of the conservation easement. Um, I feel terrible about this. This was a really, really, really important conservation property. Um, it's, it'll still, it's, it's now owned by that 25% partner. Uh, financially, it was a fine investment for Lyme uh, because of zoning and regulation in California, which is intergalactic when it comes to regulating private timber management activities, you don't have to lose sleep about what they're gonna do on that property, but it would have been a great conservation outcome. And in this case, it wasn't because the money was there, the money what wasn't there, the money was there to do this transaction. Uh, but I will go back to the beginning of that transaction uh, just because we're a little bit creative. We had tied the hand, so uh, this was a competitive purchase, meaning we were bidding against other parties to buy this property and we had exclusive uh, rights to work with the Conservation Fund, the Trust for Public Land, Save the Redwoods, and the Nature Conservancy. So those four groups could not work with any other, other bidder on the property. We offered, and it was before the kind of structure that Jason provided, we offered the California chapter that 25% interest, and they neglected to pursue that. Um, so there could have been a different story here. I'll just say one other thing just about NGOs and, and the partnership, like that's the other thing. And just looking at the list, a lot of you all are in this situation. Like we've had a very contentious relationship with some of the chapters, even when it's good at national and sometimes good relationships with the chapter, bad at national, like for an investor to deal with NGOs is like you dealing with your own NGO. It's like pretty fraught. And so sometimes you win someone over and then you lose them on the next deal. And sometimes you, so it's, so I would say it's a very dynamic partnership. Should, yeah, shouldn't pick on the Nature Conservancy, but we I mean, will. We, we um, should, which uh, not uh, their fault. But. We've worked with nine different chapters, and I think Tuesday evening we talked about if you know one foundation, yeah. you know one foundation. In the case of the Nature Conservancy, if you know one chapter, you know that chapter. So we would do something in New York, quite creative flexible. We would go to West Virginia. They would say, 
you are out of your mind. The Nature Conservancy never does anything like that. And I said, well, actually, <laughs> the New York chapter just did this transaction with us this way. Uh, so um, Peter Howell, the Conservation Finance Network. Oh, OK. Um, so uh, just one comment and then a question that goes back to just this issue. We'll be quicker. Yeah, no, no, no. That goes back to this issue of partnership. So the first, uh, the observation about carbon. Uh, I used to work for the Open Space Institute. We did one carbon deal in Maine. We will not do another for some of the reasons, Jason, that, you, uh, that you've referred to. The markets are in flux. Several of our board members simply weighed in and said, this is akin to the selling of papal pardons. We are not going to engage in this until there's greater clarity. So just, you know, I appreciate your cautions. The, the, uh, the question and then uh, really about partnerships. So both of you have described different kinds of partnerships. Um, Peter, through Down East Lakes and Jason, the project, the interesting arrangement with TNC. Peter, I'm curious, you may have answered the question. I'm curious if you would try something like what Jason just mentioned uh, to give. No, you would not. Okay. I just thought that was it. Pretty interesting, pretty interesting. But here's my plea. Um, there's a lot of NGOs in the room and um, being able to distill what were successful components of those partnerships um, would is really interesting. And letting us distill that for the community in some case studies that aren't just marketing for your two organizations, but actually get to what really were the success variables or the stumbling points from your point of view will help a lot of organizations, I think, not just the Nature Conservancy, to be able to develop these kinds of partnerships. Well, I mean, we don't have time to go into a lot of this, but the reason I quickly said no wasn't because of the structure. I actually, I'm a big fan of the structure. Uh, New Forest did something slightly similar, but in this case, the Packard Foundation played that role. Uh, but uh, we work in so many different geographies I mean, yeah, uh, that we want we want the optionality of picking the right or, or partnering with the right conservation NGO. Uh, and in certain places, the Nature Conservancy is absolutely the right conservation NGO to partner with. But for mostly political reasons, sometimes they are not the right partner to work with. Uh, and so I think Lime Timber is is looking to maintain that sort of flexibility that when it's Wisconsin, uh, the Nature Conservancy had to stay behind the curtain. They did a lot of the science on the transaction we did in Wisconsin, but they were not, notwithstanding my hippie friends who lived in Madison, that place changed. Uh, and they could not go into the Capitol with us. That was like a really bad thing to happen. So I know uh, there's at least two questions here. So the only I'd say is two things quickly. One is these more global partnerships are new. So we have some BTG has a fund that they have a partnership with TNC domestically and CI internationally, but they're they're very new. I think more conventionally, it's been done like bottom up, like Peter's describing. For any professors in the room, there's now probably enough data and evidence that you probably could start doing some case studies. But just to be clear, like we raised our fund in 2020, right? And BTG raised theirs in 2022. <laughs> so yeah. new. Two minutes. So let's let's hear the other, let's hear the two questions together or three questions. We try to answer you know that thing where you ask all the questions, you try to answer them all. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name's Lita Cunningham. I'm with Lighthouse Conservation Group in North Carolina. I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question, but I think it gets to something, um, Jason, you were saying a lot, well, this was this was dumb and this one's smart. And I think if I'm understanding what you're talking about, we're talking about optimizing the use of any given acre of land. What kind, is it science? Is it, what are the steps or the tools that go into determining and then communicating to the, some of the storytelling we were talking about yesterday that we're, um, Given the circumstances now, because I think that's something else important that you said, things have changed. And so the, dairy, the family dairy farm may have been the optimal use of that particular acre 100 years ago or so. And here's how they've changed. And here's what that looks like now. What is the process? What is the, who are the people involved? Is it a mapping exercise? Who does that? Can you talk a little bit about the early parts of the processes that you're involved in 
and how you uh, figure out the optimal use of mm -hmm. the land. Can we do the two other questions and then we'll. Oh, sure. Yeah. I have an answer to that. One other question. Sorry. A question from our virtual attendee. What do either of you see for the future of aggregation of smaller forest properties to achieve scale for carbon projects? Is there a growing interest as demand for carbon credits grow? That's a very different question. So I'll do I'll do one and then you do two. So for the first one, it's a it's a great question. Um RG not that anyone would ever know this, has the craziest data set of any investment manager in the world on water, climate, land use in California. So like I said, we've had people go to every single water district meeting in California for the last 20 years and literally write down what they put on the dry erase board and then erase after the board meeting. And then we overlaid it, like it's a really crazy system. So we can map now every acre. Now we can do every acre in the world what was grown i mean not every crop but like 15 crops what was grown there um climate water now we've got biodiversity overlays and what we think will grow there based on climate models right so we had a big corporate come to us and say hey we don't think we're able to buy cacao from this place where would you grow next and so we went and bought a bunch of land got an offtake agreement for them to buy it from us so and the the big food companies are getting super sophisticated about this they know you're not they know that you're not gonna be able to grow a lot of stuff where you grow it now so the data and modeling is massive and if you overlay that with tnc's for california wow right because they know where every critter is and they know where every um regulatory kind of line is so the short answer is a ton a ton a ton of data and that data, as you can guess, I'm sure you've talked about this all week, is just, it's becoming available exponentially, right? So it's not all perfect, it's models, but um, the data is huge. And then the storytelling, we, RG, like I said, never done a press release, terrible storytelling. Um, TNC has been an amazing partner for storytelling. So if you look at our impact reports, actually, if you, yeah. you would think it is exclusively a TNC product. They're so good at storytelling. Yeah. And I mean, and by the way, we are super happy for people to think that because our investors don't care. Like they don't, frankly, I'd say 90% of our investors don't care about TNC, except that it means we're not going to break any laws and the 10% that do fine but like i'd say for the most part our investors don't care but we do care, and tnc cares a lot so we let them do it and they're great at it um so i think that the you know the videos and the impact report and the letting tnc talk about all their chapters and is just perfect but investment firms are terrible at storytelling and so i think the ngos have to carry a lot of the burden just for the aggregation, there's a publication that was done uh, for the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership uh, with uh, a great amount of work provided by one of uh, Brad's former students when she was an intern at the Lime Timber Company two years ago, three years ago now. Uh, and uh, you can get it from Chesapeake County. So it, it provides a variety of examples of aggregation. Probably the most significant is the Cold Hollow to Canada aggregation project that Vermont Land Trust did where my two grandsons live. And so the last thing that we're gonna say, because it says stop right there, is so just so you know, for um, for Creo, um, if you have things you're working on that you think are interesting that the membership would wanna know about as potential investments, there are some people who do concessionary capital, but most are commercial. I can connect you with the person on our team who does that. For Spring Lane, they're bigger projects. We need to write kind of a five or ten million dollar equity check and kind of a ten to fifty million dollar project check. But we're we're trying to be creative. We're trying to do aggregation. We're trying to we'd love to find something to do in natural capital, nature based solutions, the stuff you guys stuff you guys do. Great. How was that? Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Peter.